All right. I think I'm finally ready. Welcome back. Get your iron in the hat tickets. Janet Switzer has them over here. Evan? At 5.15, we'll start the iron in the hat drawing. So be there. Get lots of tickets. Um, when you get a chance, go over there and see Rob and JT at Oleo Acres and check out their anvils, 10% off. Uh, we're missing a, a real nice, sharp, hearty hot cut. If anybody's seen it, or a hot cut, that's not it. There was a there was a real nice sharp one. Oh, John Switzer had it in his pocket. We got it. Don Don Hansen provided a bunch of small pieces of wrought iron over here in a box by the coffee. Grab a piece if you want. Spark test it, see what it looks like, so you remember that forever. Put it on your chain with other steel for a sample uh, to spark test. And with that, please join me in welcoming back Peter. Oh, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so uh, the other day I had four hours to do a small amount, and today I have two hours to do everything else. So <laughs> we'll, see, we'll see what happens. So the things we talked about the other day possibly doing were uh, to m forge this mounting pad for the bracket, which is a mystery until you start to see one, and then it's, oh, it's, um, I've gotten this pass-through scroll ready to weld together and then it will be ready to weld to the piece that was started the other day. So that's on the list. Uh, I have stock to make water leaves. We could make a single, probably not a double, but we can make a single and weld it to a stem. And um, I think that's about it, isn't it? So, uh, yeah, someone asked the other day about how to file a bent round shape. And so I have, I have a bent round shape that could be filed. So that, that could go on the list too. What, what's that? <laughs> Bent round file. All right. So uh, let's do the mounting pad. Does anyone have? Is there anything on here that everyone in the room says no? I don't want to do that. All right. <laughs> I was, I was, yeah, I was hoping for too much there. So I started, I started the mounting pad when no one was looking. And this is mild steel. I just grabbed this out of the scrap bin. Uh, and it, 
it's a little chunky, but it is um, half by one and a half. And I started one end, so I'll, I'll sort of do the other end and maybe weld on the extension and then make the pad. All right. That doesn't ruin the fire, nothing will. So I'll need a helper with a sledge. Yeah. Is it in, what's it in the way of? Uh, I, got a, I got a chair to put it on. Can I get one, borrow that stool? This stool is better. I'm stick it out here somewhere, that's good. Somewhere I can find it. All right, so we, hunted high and low. We turned over every tool storage area in the shop looking for one set of top and bottom fullers and we found half of a set. So this one we found, the top, uh, but we couldn't find the bottom. So. So before you spend, are they hidden on the wall? Three eight. That's the wrong category. Uh, it's a little sharp. Yeah. So before, before everyone anticipates. Before everyone anticipates what I need, before everyone anticipates what I need, this one's not bad. So I, I have made a, a quickie go anywhere. You can be anywhere and make your own fuller in a heartbeat. So this is just mild steel, flat bar. When you do that, it doesn't tip over. So. Let's see if we'll try both of them and see. We can do the, uh, the mileage test and see which one does better. Whew. Boy, I wish I had this much eager help at home. <laughs> Just the opposite. Well, why don't you get it yourself? <laughs> I'm not going out there. You, you want it, you go find it. All right, ready? Yeah, this is almost ready. We'll see what we get. Okay, got to hit really hard. That's it. That's it. Keep going. We're going to go. Don't go faster, just hard. We're going to go till we get halfway through. All right, let's try the, uh, let's see what, let's just suppose we didn't have that. We can do, we can do the same thing, stand in the same spot. Excellent. All right, so, yeah, yeah, yep. Anyone slapping their foreheads yet? Okay. So this can go in the uh, silent auction or in the iron in the hat. Apparently we need it here. 
here. Yeah. <laughs> and um, actually, one thing would be handy if we had a square set hammer with radius corners. So if we don't, we'll we'll survive. And I'm going to use, I'm going to go to the hammer next. So I didn't have any wrought iron big enough for this, or it would have been easier to make out of iron. But the steps are the same, iron or steel. So this is mild steel out of the scrap bin. Um, Uh, uh, we, if there's a rounder one, well, let's, I'll, I'll hold on to this one and okay. on the chance that there's a rounder one. Here's another choice. Oh, good. This is excellent. One leg. Yeah, you can put that one back. Okay, let's let's do this next step. And so we're going to work over a radius corner of the anvil, and we have a sort of a matching radius. <laughs> Good. So when I'm working with a striker, I, I have two jobs. One, I have to think about, no, we're, I think we're, well, let's just do some light blows. Uh, so one is how to plan the work, how to do the steps, and the second is how to communicate clearly with the striker. So whoever has a sledge is never confused about what they're supposed to do in the next two seconds. <laughs> and then that usually means instant communication. So if you watch, we're uh, going to let her hit, and if I want her to keep hitting, I'll just keep the tool there, but if enough, I want to just stop and look, as soon as you hit, I move the tool, and then you know, don't swing again. You, know, you can rest. So the other way I often communicate, if I'm trying to position the tool, I don't turn it upright until I'm ready then there's no confusion about when I'm ready or not. If you're holding the tool like this and you say, well, maybe another 16th, 
you don't have any idea when it's positioned right. And it's unfair to expect you to have that. But so we can position the tool when I'm ready. You hit. So you know when to rest and when to hit. And I know when you're going to rest and when you're going to hit. That's just as important. So the, the issue isn't, I don't have to know what I'm doing all the time. I just have to know enough so that you're not confused. And if I want to take five seconds and look, all I have to do is signal stop. But you have to do that. You have to do that before the sledge is moving. Yeah. Because, boy. There's nothing worse than you not knowing whether the thing is going to get moved away at the last second or me not knowing if the sledge is going to hit something that I don't want it to hit. Nora, we, if you would. <laughs> what, what? Don't push a button to make it be quiet. <laughs> All right, let's do the same. We'll do the same on this side. And we'll just. Oops. So you want to hit just an even, steady pace. Then I know when you're going to hit. Good. All right, so. Now we have that lump set aside for the pad. Let's, let's do something with it. I get someone to come help me. Call the wife? No, no. I know I have too much respect for her to make that request. But I have a few um, hobbyist friends that live nearby, and they can't wait for me to call them up and say, you know, you want to swing a sledge for a couple hours? They want you to hope. No, they just want to do it. No, they. No, no, no. I have real hobby blacksmith friends. I, I know it's hard to believe, but I, I honest, honest, I really do. <laughs> They're grown ups, too. <laughs> All right, you ready? Let's, uh, so now we're going to, oh, should have had better tongs. A little slower. And it can hit a little harder. Get some more heat. One, let's hit it one more time. Great. All right. So I'm just trying to continue the line of the tenons. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's really a very simple procedure. I'll, I'll come back on one condition. You zoom way in. I don't want you to stop here. All right. So it's, it's really simple. You don't need to lay it out ahead of time. All right. Oh, man. Is he good or is he good? Woo! I mean the cameraman. <laughs> that, is, that is excellent. Yeah, that's worthy of PBS. <laughs> All right, good. So we'll do that same thing one more heat. So I'm going to try to forge that groove down to the final thickness of the pad. So this is, this you're, is that bracket, the frame, the frame bracket? Uh, both, of, both of these have the same nailing pad or mounting pad detail here we can you can see all right Uh, no, I think just a higher heat will do it. Peter, how deep do you take that right now? Third of the material? Third of the material down deep? I'm trying to leave about an eighth of an inch. Okay. And I've started with half inch. Right. Or, or roughly. And, um, This is a cross section through the pad. I want to leave it thick, thick where it joins the, the uh, rib, the thick rib in the center. Or thicker and a nice radius transition between the rib and the flange. So now we're starting to stretch. You know, let's we can turn sideways maybe. Even though this is unnatural, we could Okay, good. We could do it for the sake of our loyal audience. spot to do this. Shut. 
which we will probably highlight in yellow caution paint. But otherwise, we're going to ignore it. So let's give me a hand on this heat, and we'll just uh, hopefully we'll round up that transition. So I'm going to tip the tool in, but I want you to hit not this way, but right. the outside edge okay. of the top. Okay. Like, yeah. Like that. Yep. See how the tool doesn't skid out of the work? You're, you're driving it down and in against the corner. So, excellent, excellent. Well, looks like we got extra thickness. All right, so there's half. I'm sorry? No, oh, it's, it's horror of horrors. It's not symmetrical. Here, you want to go to the anvil once? Let's see. Let's see what we have here. Oh, boy. All right. So. are going to have nightmares after this one. All right. Okay, so what could we do? What could we do about that? Uh, I have to uh, advocate that one of the options is nothing. We could do nothing about that. That's a perfectly good option. But we could also do something. I think I'm going to have to. Which way do we want to go? Here? that magically that has come back into the realm of acceptable. All right, so that side is finished. Uh, we could punch the holes. We could find the stuff in time. So I'll need your help. And um, so let's try to hit the punch. So hard doesn't have to be horribly hard, but. One more, quick, yeah, two really quick blows. Okay. Good. Okay. 
Now you can slow down now. The, the urgency is past. One more. Good. All right. All right, so now we can zoom in. Look at how shiny. All right, so I won't. I don't need to do the other half, um, but we can stick the rest of the stem on it. All right. That's all for now. Thank you, thank you. Excellent. A good communicator. So I have, I'm just going to weld a scrap of something on here, but you get the sense of how you make this segment and then add whatever you need to. Well, I hope I'm going to weld something. I'm sorry? Do you squirt or force weld the square corner or do you upset? The, that corner is upset, bent and upset. Oh, that was the other thing that was supposed to be on the list was an upset corner. So I have a really simple scarf that I use. Yep. Boy, this is a slippery. I'm going to do it again for the other piece, except um, this one I'm going to upset first. Forget, I forget how responsive this stuff is. So here's the scarf. I'm going to make a really blunt taper. And then I'm going to feather out the very tip. Yep. All right, and that's it. Very tip is narrower than the parent bar, and ideally shorter than the stock thickness. And and thin on the end.
see if this is the real stuff. Well, I put, so I put both pieces in the fire, scarfs up, right next to each other, and then I just do the same to both. I like, I like using a little borax first because it gets gooey and it holds whatever else you throw on it. Okay. So you have your welding surfaces up. Yeah, they're both up. So when I get to the anvil, I have to turn one of them over. and and. It's helpful if you turn the top one over. <laughs> it really makes a difference. It's a long way to the anvil, but oh, they're sticking a little. Cold, but let's see what happens. Right. So. Ideally, I aim my goal is to do the entire weld in one heat. So ideally you would have that a little bit hotter? Yeah, the, the bottom one was a little cold. So it would have given me a little more time to keep going. Right. No, the flux doesn't fall off. <laughs> that's like that's like uh, the Roy Underhill when he was starting out. You know, he got to visit with these old guys, and one of, one of them was sharpening an axe. And Roy says he's sitting at the gr the pedal grindstone. He says. Which way is it better to sharpen? Do you want to turn the stone away from you, or do you want to turn the stone towards you? Know, is it which one makes a better edge? And the guy says, "Well, you always turn it away from you." Wow, is it how does that give you the right shape? You know, it's just no. If you turn it towards you, the water all goes in your lap. <laughs> so, that was the secret. <laughs> Where did I put those tongs? Oh, yeah, there they are.
So I have only, I would say only one thing that's really useful in, um, oh, you want to look at this? One thing that's really useful in planning this weld around the bracket is that you really don't want, you do not want that weld to be located right where you're going to make the corner. If there's a test of the weld, that will be it. All right. Okay, so. So uh, um, the water leaf may take, I don't know what the, how high that is on the urgent list, but maybe we should, I'd rather go a little farther on this thing first and see what we have time for. Yeah. Oh, that's, all right. What, what is it? What do you, hey oh uh. Oh, yeah. Are you actually hitting that target? So, um, my theory on welding uh, is, um, or welding slash scarfing, is that the scarf is not supposed to fit the other piece. If the scarf in, in my practice, if you make the scarf exactly fit the other piece, you have a much lower chance of success. You want the scarf to be designed so it they touch in the center of the, of the overlap first and gradually squirt everything out. You want it, the scarf to be designed so the overlap is as short as possible. And what else? Hopefully easy to do. So when I set it up on the anvil, I, I try to do that. So I don't I do not try to do that. But that's just my practice. And then what's your sequence of hitting that? Well, you try to stick the middle first. The middle, okay. Yeah. So if you seal the edges down first, then you have the chance of making a nice pocket in the center. So you do middle on one side, middle on the other, and then the skin? Well, if you. So I, I think you get a better weld the fewer heats you take. And so the, once you know it's not going to fly apart, you can hit really hard. So if I hit once or twice and I feel that they're solid, I can really mash the middle. And I don't have to hit the middle from the other side with a hard blow. And then I look to see if any of the, either of the scarves is getting cool and go right to that one. Um, yeah. Do you always upset just one end, or do you upset both ends at times? Both, um, both pieces, you just upset one end. You, well, this is another of my uh, late in life insights, is that what, what is the purpose of upsetting? Sure. So if I ask, you guys all know, oh, when you're a weld, you have to upset, right? Why? What's All right, and, and so, so you don't forge it down too far without going too thin. And so where are you likely to get it too thin by forging it down? Right here? I, if you think that, you're hitting way too hard. Because you've got double the amount of thickness there to start with that you're going to end up with. You, you don't need any extra material in the overlap area. 
You've already got too much. You need extra material outside the overlap area. This is the area that's likely to get too thin. The areas you're going to hammer on, but there's no overlap. So the upsetting ideally should be back from the end. And you only need to upset if your starting bar is the size you want to end up with. So what did I have here? So I had in this starting bar, I've got about uh, 9 sixteenths by 5 eighths and I'm welding half inch square to it. So this 9 sixteenths by 5 eighths is already much heavier than what I'm joining it to and so I don't need to upset that one. It's already too big. But if I wanted to end up with half inch square after the weld and I'm starting with half inch square, I would want to upset that one. So if I'm starting with half inch square and I want to end up with half by quarter, then I don't need to upset either one. You're only upsetting if you think the, you're going to go below your target finish thickness. And you always will reduce the bar on either side of the well. So, all right, you can pass this around. What was I doing next here? Oh, so I've got, um, I've got this piece. I got the uh, little rat tail scroll to pass through. You can see I've marked where the two, where the weld is supposed to start. Hmm? Well, that's next up. So, what else can we look at? Nothing. So, you can see these two center punch marks. If I line up the two marks, that means they're slid together the right amount. All right, see the punch marks. We'll go back to the anvil. There are two punch marks right there. Yeah. You see them? That's where I want the weld to first to start. So I want to weld from those dots out. Or from here to the dots. So the dots just let me verify that the pieces are slid together in the orientation I want them to end up with in the finished product. This one's kind of an aggravating one because they always slip apart, but we'll see what we can get. So I've already planned ahead. And I already have the dot on this piece where I want this combo to align with. So I'll pass this one around. I'm going to need it in uh, 
three and a half minutes, so. Um, I do. Well, I, uh, I've been collecting the old Easy Well, and that's what I use most. I've got a little bit of paper. I think you actually s supplied me with a little at some point, but I, I won't turn any down. So that is the best for me. All right, done. <laughs> this this one's hard to hold together because the inside one tends to s spin on that rat tail. It it not only does that, but it Halfway to the dots. Let's try this. Okay, and so I've tried to um, maintain this nice graceful departure. Uh, I guess I probably need to do that.
Uh, yeah, well, um, with iron, if you've got both of them at thorough all the way through welding heats, they don't tend to distort unevenly. After the first blow, it's one solid bar. But, but it's, um, if it's not solidly welded, then it's good to turn them over. Uh, I would say it's more pronounced than steel. So the idea here is to make both scrolls look good, is even if they were not 
together. So uh, I have to, for this, this one, I have to follow what I've begun on the other side of the hole. The other side of the hole determines the shape of the scroll. So this section I can't change. So I have to make this match. I have to make this part match that. And then the other thing that's really important is you have a choice about uh, when you get this far, you have a choice. And the choice is, would you rather make this a pleasing element or would you rather make it match the drawing? Pleasing. And it's, a, it's one or the other, usually. <laughs> and you don't have to provide the drawing to the client. <laughs> Tell them whether you matched it perfectly or not. So, I believe it's matching, matching the drawing is important when it's got to fit a piece of stone or a window opening, but this element is in the middle of space. All right, so we'll tweak it in a bit. All right, so let's put this up on the, the camera. like I've still got a little bit of a wrinkle uh, right about there. <laughs> well, you watch. I'm going to hit it once and everyone's going to breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> oh, so much better. <laughs> now look at it. Now look at it. You thought it was good before. Is that, uh, that other element coming back? Um, Can I, um, can I borrow that in a, uh, just in a minute? I will borrow that in a minute. All right, Every, this might be a good, since everyone's got up enough to stretch their legs, this might be a good time to get up and stretch your legs. So I'm going to do a measuring, and then in five minutes, I'm going to start working again. And I'm not going to tell anyone when five minutes is up. 2.30, 2.30, Chinese dentist time. Not too bad a match. Not too bad a match.
I'll get you. All right, so I'm, I'm heating the pieces up for the next weld. I've got the small scroll trimmed to length, and it's positioned in the larger scroll. And as soon as they get hot, we will, as soon as they burn, well, I don't know if this is going to stay. No. No. I keep forgetting to use it. I'll use it next. I, I've used it on mild steel with really good success. Yeah, I'm getting anxious about this one. This one's a big one. I don't want to experiment on this one. So while everyone was out stretching, I prepared the bar that gets welded to this segment. So,
Well, they were, uh, they were like this. And so I was trying to, yeah. Weld up just a little farther if I can. So uh, there's one thing that helps these layered welds. When you have the two separate pieces in the fire, the bottom one heats so much faster. Once you act, just stick them together, one blow then you get heat transfer through the joint. And then the two heat a lot more evenly. So you get the upper, the thin one, to catch up a lot better once they're physically stuck. This would be a good time for some Iron Mountain Flux. Except someone has burned the lid shut. Now that's what I call zealous flexing. Burn the burn the dispenser. Uh, 
Oh, good. It's fire is fire is uh, voicing voicing discontent. I wouldn't give for Ow. I'm surprised I don't have a turning hammer for this. Amazing. This fire is not so good, but the flux was great. Fires, all dust.
So I have a couple of big, what, what my friend Doug likes to call a wow. There's a wow in that bar. old is Doug? I think Doug is about 70. <laughs> Got me there. <laughs> it was so hot yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> At least someone's a fan of So let's see if I can convince this to do something better. is about the point where you realize it's never going to be what you hoped and you just try to make it into something you don't mind. I'm going to do a, just a little, and I'm actually going to use the modern tool that I've been, that you have been waiting hours to watch me use. When you need one, you can't find one. Where are the little ones? Where are the little, the little ones? Little, small. Yeah. Thanks. You know, I I have seen blacksmiths. Yeah. You can tr you can tr try to blackmail me, but it's not going to work. just kind of spoiling it as I go, so.
I got a, I have a really lumpy joint here, but I think it's going to stay there forever. All right, so let's. Yeah, that's what I'm going to do next. So I'm going to show you a really nice way to make a square corner. What's that? A square corner on a round stock because we all need to use No, I signed, I had to sign a waiver saying I wouldn't do that. <laughs> That's the intellectual property of one of your members. I don't know anyone. <laughs> well, it's the pro it's property anyway. All right, so I'm just gonna we'll just cut our losses here. Around. All right, so I think you got the gist of it. All right. All right, any questions before we go on to something more manageable? Yeah. Could you tell us about Uh, yeah, I can give you a quick, a really quick, well, this is heating. May take, I may get to make a long explanation because this fire is a little slow. There were a few There were a few anvil makers in the American colonies, but probably not many. The earliest I've seen is an ad in the Boston paper in 1717 for an anvil maker. And they advertised they would make smiths, anvils, silversmiths, coppersmiths. I don't think they listed tinsmiths, but all, all the trades that used anvils of any size. And so most anvils in the colonies were coming from England, and they're uh, they're real stubby shape usually, with a stubby little horn. like that. Often a hardy hole, not always, and almost never a pritchel hole. And um, no, no table like this one has. And, and I think they pretty much stayed like that until closely after 1800. And then the table starts to appear. But the basic shape stayed the same. The material, what were they made of? Uh, they were made of wrought iron for the body and high carbon steel for the face. Right, uh, just like anvils from 1900. So the materials didn't change for 300 years or the process, just the style changed more than anything. Um, When was the first cast anvil? I don't know. The first, there's an anvil that was found at Saugus Ironworks that was cast iron. 
and that's from about 1640. So that's made in America, Saugus, Massachusetts. I think there have always, always been, uh, well, if you're talking about cast with a steel face, that's another story. So they were cast anvils of poor quality long before the, the Fisher, which was a cast iron with a hardenable steel face. And I never, I'm not an avid anvil history student. Is that, are they 1849? Is that when the patent is? Something like that. Is that, is that everything anyone ever wanted to know about 18th century anvils? They're mostly fairly light. I would say mostly under 175 pounds. And um, the reason they're marked in their weight is that the price was a, was a cost per pound. And so if you bought an anvil, you paid so many pence per pound, and that's stamped right on the anvil. And that was true for leg vices also. They usually have the weight stamped right in the front of the front jaw. And um, nine pence per pound was the, the rate that you see in Williamsburg. Um, all right, let's, let's make a, let's make a, Okay, so I just forged a step, forged down everything on either side of that little step, and that's going to become the corner. Getting close? Pretty close. Oh, I thought it was, oh, all right. Can I have five minutes? I thought it was 3.15 for uh, something. That's when the next guy started. Yeah. All right. You were in, your hand was in. Okay, sorry. Just. So a lot of people say when they're making an upset square corner, well, you, you're moving metal into the corner. And uh, my question would be, well, if you're moving metal into the corner, where are you taking it away from? So if someone has an answer to that one day, I'd love to hear it. The closet. So now we have, where are we? Where are you? OK. 
take one upsetting heat and that should sharpen it up. Can. Got one of these. Well, I can't do that anymore. All right, so I'm going to stop, even though I could keep going for hours on this corner. It's close enough that you can, you can see the goal line from here. All right, so um, it's, it's possible, but I don't think it's likely to start with a uniform size and upset the corner and make it sharp on the outside without upsetting that section first. And every time I see people do it, they don't, to my really fussy eye, they don't maintain the full stock thickness on both sides of the corner. Well, you, you guys do it with a torch. That, you can get pretty good results that way. Yeah, it's, hard, it's harder to do it in the, sh in the forge because the heat is f much farther around the corner on both sides. But I've said it with an air chisel. Where did you take it from? Yeah, oh yeah, you upset it, yeah, yeah. So you're getting more material there at the corner, yeah. All right. Yeah, one more question. Yeah, if, well, if you do it what I did, you can make the peak of that mountain where you want the corner to be. So you can make two of them a certain distance apart and that's how far the corners will be apart. If you're starting with a uniform bar and you bend it and upset it, you lose a half the thickness of the bar in each dimension. So I... Yeah. Well, if you lay it out, um, before you, while the bar is straight, it, 
then you, I always mark it on the center line. And then when you bend it, you keep the dot in the center of the bend. And when you're all done with the corner, the dot should still be in the center of the bend. The dot should end up on that line. So if you want to, if you wanted to make that, and this is half inch square, and you want this to be, uh, let's say, six inches. All right. Dot to dot is how much? Five and a half. Quarter inch in here and a quarter inch in here. So your center to center distance is five and a half. And it's going to shrink half a, di half a thickness here and half a thickness here. So you have to add that much extra in your layout. So you would make your dots six inches apart. By the time you're done upsetting, the dots will be five and a half inches apart. Francis drew a picture similar to that here one time. Asked uh, how much stock was it made to do that? Then you can said, "Pound a ton." <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I ran over time, but I will help out. All right. So, thank you, thank you, thank you. Pleasure to be here.